Welcome to this episode of Pen to Paper Press Podcast. I'm Cindy Coaches. There is a backstory weaved into each book. To explore the creative process, I am sitting down with authors, writers, editors, publishers, and an array of creative souls to have a conversation centered on how they developed their story to completing their works of art. Each episode is an opportunity for us to explore mindsets, pearls of wisdom, and the experiences that began our journey as an author from the moment we put pen to paper. Michael Shuttle is the author of Career Change Guide. Taking the right path could make all the difference. In his book, he provides ideas, stories, and recommended action steps for those looking to make a shift in their career. Welcome, Michael. It is so good to have you here. Thank you, Cindy. After I went to business school, uh, I went, uh, actually went to Yale and Harvard Business School. I was in the Navy in between uh, uh, two of those. I, um, I went to work for a small company in Philadelphia, which is where I grew up, uh, in a manufacturing company and marketing. And I ran a small business within the company. But then I, I, about th- after three years, I got interested in a, something Xerox was doing in using behavioral sciences to train people. And it was called Effective Listening was a course they had that taught you how to speed read. Uh, and, and it's very much like uh, listening, when you speed read, uh, like listening is like speed reading. You get, you get the structure of something and then you understand what the key words are. Well, anyhow, that led to 10 years at Xerox where I worked for five different business units, uh, each very different. I was always, almost always in the new business section of Xerox, starting new businesses. And I discovered that in each, uh, each individual section had its own culture. Uh, the president, the corporate the sponsor, the, the uh, founder of Xerox uh, was named Joe Wilson. He had a small company in Rochester, New York, Haloid, that made uh, photographic papers, and he created Xerox. But anyhow, after 10 years at Xerox in five different business units, um, I, uh, I actually was, I left Xerox and I was approached by a search firm for a client. And the client um, uh, and the consultant at uh, the first search firm, Hydric and Struggles, uh, presented me to the client, and the client said, well, I don't want to meet that guy. He went to Yale and Harvard Business School. He's too stuck up. He wouldn't work very hard. Oh, oh, my, oh my God. Right? <laughs> uh, that, that had, but then the consultant said, well, Mike, what about joining our firm? Uh, we think he'd be good with us. And so I, uh, I said, well, that's interesting. And so I interviewed with many of the partners, and they checked my references, and I joined Hydric and Struggles. And that's a firm that finds executives for companies. We get retained, we get retained, and then we try to find out what, what the person's supposed to do and what are the values in the company, and then we find candidates for the uh, client. And mm-hmm. I did that for 23 years, and I learned that all, every company has its own culture, uh, its own priorities. There's no one, there's no two that are alike ever. And um, after 23 years there, I felt well, I've done, that's enough. I've done enough of that. It was, it was a lot of travel, and uh, I'm in California, and the clients were mostly in the West, and uh, but the candidates were all over the country, so I did a lot of traveling. Okay. Uh, uh, but anyhow, um, I'll get back to something else in a minute. But that, but that led to my retiring from Hydric and Struggles, and then uh, soon I was uh, volunteering at a, home, at a, uh, uh, a non-for-profit called Chrysalis in downtown Los Angeles that finds... Uh, Helps home, home, people that are not necessarily homeless, but very poor people who don't have work looking for to get a job. Many of them were former felons right out of prison. And they really wanted to work straight. And so mm-hmm. I, I stayed there for four years, actually five years, teaching job prep to the homeless. And I would be once a week, I'd go downtown. And, and But that then I started, I met somebody who was a, um, forming an executive MBA program at Loyal Marymount. I met him on an airplane, and he suggested that we talk about it. And I ended up creating a course there in career planning for executive MBAs. And this, these were about 25 people uh, in work, some work experience who wanted to do something different or better than they were doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I Then uh, after a couple of years, I had a partner there who was uh, very helpful because I'm more the idea guy. and She was more the people person. So Together, we made a team, just like my wife and I are like that. I'm an mm-hmm. I, 
and she's very much when, when somebody says something, I say, well, why are they saying that? What does that mean? She says, well, why are they saying that? What are they feeling? What's going on with them? So anyhow, that's a difference between us and that's a little bit about me. But uh, I really learned a lot in teaching. Uh, I got a much better understanding and focus on what makes a difference when people, where they work and what they do. And after doing that for 17 years, I decided to retire from that and write a book about it. I mean, so I, first of all, so I started writing the book, I don't know, seven or six or seven years ago. And I, I took notes for about a, a summer. I just got a notepad and sat on a porch and wrote notes out of what I might put in the book. And then eventually that turned to the first draft. And I put together the basic book in about a year and a half. Um, uh, and as I went through it, I learned ideas. Uh, for instance, um, I'd always felt that, and I found that, um, that, that in executive search, our clients uh, hired people mostly who, who'd been referred to us by somebody else. And it wasn't, we were cold calling and when we would do that and see if somebody was interested in the job. It was usually when somebody said, Mike, I understand what you're saying. I know somebody that would fit that job. And um, the two thirds of our placements were people who were referred to us. And I also, and when I did the volunteering at Chrysalis, I had them every uh, week. Um, every time somebody got a job, they rang a bell. And it, the person talked about the job that they got. And so I said, for one month, ask the person how he found out about, or she found out about the job. And what do you know? It was about 60% found out the job from somebody else. So it was, so at all levels, uh, referrals are really the key to getting the right job because People who refer you get a feel for you and a feel for the job, and, and it's more likely to be to work out. So anyhow, um, that, I've lost my train of thought there. But um, so writing the book, I, I I put those ideas in the book, ideas that I learned while I was writing it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the hard part was editing the book and figuring on the title of the book. It took forever to come up with the right title, and or a title that I felt comfortable with. I have a son who helped me with it. He's very creative and had a lot, some ideas, and that was helpful. My wife edited the book. She was a former school teacher. But I found that I repeated myself many times, and I kept editing it and shortening the book and bringing it into sharper focus. And so what you have now is four, four, four and a half years of effort, a year and a half writing, and three years of editing. And that's what we need today as the book. Okay. And, um, the three, the three and a half years of editing sounds very familiar. So <laughs> I'm sure that's what most people, you know, go through. <laughs> oh, it was about 70 edits. And I, and I published a book on Amazon. So what I could do is I could have them, uh, I would have them print a copy of the book and send it to me. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, I would edit it and then do another one. I finally decided don't do that. Just take it down to a local. Um, print shop, print it up, and then edit that. So I had paper copies that I would edit. And I yes. must have 70 edits or so. It was a lot. And, uh, and I think it is better now because it gives the, says the idea once, it gives some suggestions of what other stories, of what other people have done, and then some, some recommended action. But then I leave space in the end of each chapter for notes. So it's really a notebook. It's a workbook. It's, it's not just okay. a, it's a workbook. And, uh, the basic ideas, there are three fundamental ideas of the book itself. Uh, the first is you have to know who you are. Uh, too many times people look for a job because that's what their parents, and, they, and it used to be like that all the time. The parents would decide what the son would do or the daughter would do. The daughter would not go to college or she would become a, a nurse if she ever got any kind of a school teacher, but that was about it. And uh, the husband, the, the son would follow the father. Senior son would follow the followers. Father's mm -hmm. son, the other son, nobody much cared about it. I was one of the other sons, so they didn't care about what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went off by myself. But anyhow, um, know who you are. The most important thing are your values. Your core values, like is integrity important to you? Yes, it is. But what's more important? There are many things that are important, like honesty, openness, uh, integrity, uh, caring for others. But then you have to say, which are the most important to me? They all can't be the most important. Some are more important than others. Mm -hmm. In addition, if the, 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 where you grew up, the, your culture of your family's culture, 
uh, the community you were a part of, if you were in a synagogue or church or a temple, uh, the culture there, that's part of who you were as a child and where you're, you're, your friend, your friends in, in, in your neighborhood, uh, that has a lot to do about your early culture. Then, so, so that's another thing to think about when you think who you are. The third thing, think about your current life. I mean, you may be married to, uh, and your spouse may, may want you to be available to help take care of the children. Or uh, maybe even if you're for another job, your spouse doesn't want to leave where he or she is because she's, well, doing well where she is. So you, you have to think about that too. So where you are, who, your values are a combination of your core values, your, your culture, and your, your, your current issues. Now me, for instance, I've, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I was in the, in the Olympics in 1952 when I was 15 years old. I sailed with a professor from um, the University of Pennsylvania in a 5.5 meters, a 32-foot sloop. And uh, in the Olympics, we're in Helsinki, Finland. We went over to Sweden in early June and spent about a month practicing with the Swedes in Sandham, which is headquarters of the Royal Swedish Yacht Club of Stockholm in the, in the Baltic. And then we sailed across the Baltic, Helsinki. And I was I ended up as the alternate. They had three people on the boat. They had two twin brothers who just graduated from college and me. I became the alternate. But I did race in one race, the, the sixth out of the seventh race. We won that race. And went on to win the Olympics. Now they didn't give me a medal, but everybody says, "You, you Michael, you have a medal. If you, uh, <laughs> you Google me, you'll see that I'm a medalist, but I'm not. I didn't get a medal, but it didn't matter. I, I had an amazing summer at 15 years old in Sweden, uh, Finland, meeting a man, and, and my professor spoke Swedish. He was and he was involved in the Nobel Institute, so we had many friends in Sweden. And I chased the Swedish and Finnish girls. <laughs> <laughs> It was a lot of fun. And we were in a yacht club. Uh, we weren't, it wasn't like the Olympics are now where you're sequestered. We were actually, uh, um, the sailors were in different yacht clubs in Sweden, in Finland. And uh, so we met many people from the local yacht club and, and we went on to do well. But, um, and that began my experience with the Olympics. And then later on in 1972, it was 20 years later, I tried out for the Olympics with a friend and we were second in the Olympic trials. And uh, we were selected as alternates on the U.S. Olympic team, Kiel, Germany. And uh, that was another Olympic experience. And I became like the weatherman for the uh, team. I went and found out what the weather was going to be that day and tried to scope out what the winds would be doing. And, and it was lots of fun. Um, then, uh, and, and, and between those, I've been involved somewhat with, you. Uh, well, not too much, actually. Some, but not too much. Anyhow, th that led to my starting to get more involved with the U.S. Olympic uh, program. And I went to some of the meetings and uh, the Olympic U.S. sailing would have. And um, it turned out the Olympics then came to Long Beach uh, in 1984. And um, I was, uh, I sailed out of the Alameda Bay Yacht Club in Long Beach. And, and the person who was basically responsible for bringing the Olympics, for doing the Olympic sailing, uh, knew me well. He'd been on the team in 1972. He said, Mike, why don't you be the head of the group that puts together the Olympics for uh, Los Angeles for the sailing? And I said, why me? I said, well, um, actually, there's two groups here. Uh, why are you and the, and the uh, U.S. US uh, sailing group? Uh, there's two groups within U.S. sailing. And they don't really get along all that well. And nobody knows you, so you won't have any enemies. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was later at a meeting, and I was telling this to a judge. He said, Mike, don't worry, you will. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I organized. I organized it, uh, a group. Uh, we had a committee, and we got. It's not just a competition. It's uh, it's the um, the uh, protocol. It, it, it's measuring the boats. It's getting people to run the races, uh, and, and uh, judges. And, and the judges are supplied by U.S. the International Irish Union. But anyhow, I ended up actually running the competition in the Olympics in '84. And uh, the head of the U.S. team was somebody I sailed with, with Dr. Chance back in Sweden. Before I'd gone to Sweden, I sailed with Sam Merrick, and I knew him well, and I watched what he did in running the Olympic program for the United States. I actually was on his committee for four years before the Olympics. And I learned a lot from him. But after the Olympics, um, I uh, sort of retired from that, although I stayed somewhat involved. <clears throat> I became Commodore of Los Angeles Yacht Club 
focus more locally. Um, but then, um, uh, actually, I was asked if after the Olympics, I wanted to run the U.S. sailing team for the next quadrennium. I said, no, 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 I'm too busy. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, ended, uh, but I did four years later take over running the U.S. sailing program. So in '88 to '92, I was the I was in charge of the program, and we had I put together regattas and one in Florida and other places and training and ended up as a team leader in Barcelona. And uh, that too was really exciting. And seeing the Olympic sailors and, and doing, and one lesson I learned from that, which I put in the appendix of my book, is one has to be in the moment and focus on what one is doing. One can't think about winning a medal. One has to think about, about doing the right thing at, at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, that's true in business too, or life. You, you don't. You think about the goal. You don't. You lose focus on what you're doing. You want to do what you're doing well, and uh, and and that will lead to some more things that are useful. And in the Olympics, there was a woman who uh, was a very good sailor, and she she uh, unfortunately was over the starting line in the first race and didn't go back, so she was disqualified. There were seven races that gave her one one disqualification. That's no problem. But then the next race, she's at the dock and about to leave. And I go down there to send her off and get her thinking about just having a nice time and sailing well. And she says, what's the word? And there's, right next to me is a trainer. And the trainer says, gold medal, that's the word. Well, she was over the starting line early in that race, too, and, just, and didn't go back and was disqualified. So here she is, five races ago, two disqualifications. She says, well, you know, I'll just have fun and sail and do my best and have fun. She won a bronze medal. Oh, that's, nice. Isn't that nice? And that's what it takes, just doing what you like to do. So that's one, that's one, that's a side message that I like put at the end of the book. But knowing who you are, what you do well is important, obviously. Mm-hmm. But you always do what you most do well. For instance, I'm more an engineer brain, but I'm more interested in people and how they live their lives and what they do. So I focused on that my whole life. And, uh, and I do okay with it. <laughs> I like to interview people, and I don't mind being interviewed. It's fun to meet people and see what they're up to, I think. And if you can, if you can impact them in some way, to me, that's a great joy. And people I, I interview here now, I mean, children of friends of ours, and some of them have changed their lives for that. And I've helped, enjoyed coaching the students at LMU. And I've written this book because I want to help people figure out what they want to do. And, and that way, I'll have accomplished something that I think is important. Too many people these days think in terms of money they can make, uh, the prestige they might get, when it's really what, the, what they've contributed. At the end of the day, if you ask any really successful person, what was important in your life? How do you feel about what you've done? They'll almost always say, well, you know, I really worked with some wonderful people and I developed some great relationships. And I think we did something good for society. So I feel good about that. Mm-hmm. The money or the prestige, they mentioned what they gave. So that that's it. That's another sort of subliminal message that I put in the book. Think about what you what you can give and contribute. And um, but anyhow, then the next question is, how do you find a job? Well, there's you can go online now. Indeed has a lot of options. Uh, LinkedIn. There are many webs. There are many websites that can help you identify. Yes, please. But usually, there's many many other people that are doing the same thing you are, and they get more resumes than you can possibly ever. Uh, respond to each one. They, so they call out the few that look most interesting and respond to that. So that's the priority, the probability of doing that are low. They're not impossible, but they're not great. Again, if you can get referred by somebody that knows you or has a feeling for your, your values and what you can do, that's, you're more likely to get a job that works. So networking by contacting people you, you, you respect, who you like, and ask them what are their thoughts about the world, as you start your search, ask about what they're doing and how they feel about that. Then as you get more, a uh, better understanding of the world out there, you might say, well, you know, I like to work in this industry. See who you know that may be in that industry and see if they can make suggestions. The companies are all different. I was in a, an executive search firm. My firm, Hydric and Struggles, is a Midwestern firm. Um, we were privately owned. We were very Midwestern, understated, not very fancy. Uh, we had the firm out here in Los Angeles headquartered was, was uh, more of a California uh, culture. Uh, there was a firm in New York that was uh, 
or a lot of Yalies like me in it. And so they all have their different cultures. So mm-hmm. organization is unique. And, and getting referred to just one that fits you is important. So that's the second major concept of this book. The third one is um, to interview the company. Many times when people go into an interview, they want to look good. They want to show how smart they are, how much they can do. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's yes. Not, that's not really very helpful because you may not find out much about the company. They may hire you. Then you learn that, oh, no, I don't want to work here. I don't like the people or I don't really like what I'm doing. So yes. you go into an interview, prepare yourself to get to understand who they are and what they're doing. I recommend highly writing your questions down on a piece of paper. And just bring a notebook or a pad or just something with your questions on it that you think would be important for you to know. Questions like, like how do they work together? Uh, who, how are decisions made? Tell me about a recent decision and how it was made. Uh, who, who, what don't you? What don't you like? What? What? what none, but no place is perfect. How would you? If you were to make modify this place, how would you change it? Uh, and then and the other thing is. You try to talk to people that used to work there and get their thoughts about it. Mm, but anyway, yes. Ask questions. And, and, and the other thing is the questions you ask uh, will tell them a lot about you. A good interviewer will, 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 will be very conscious of what the questions are asked. For instance, if you ask questions about the compensation, well, what's the money pay? Is there a bonus? How about vacation time? <laughs> what about that? Uh, that won't go over very well. Whereas if you ask, well, uh, what are the, how does, is there teamwork here? Who, what, how does it work? What, what can I contribute here? What, what, what needs to be done? Uh, what are the values of the organization? What are they, what are, what's happening? Uh, those kinds of questions will show them that that's the kind of person you are. So the questions are important. But mm-hmm. you ask for, <laughs> ask for what's important to you. And then that'll show them who you are. If you're not the right person for their, that organization, you don't want them to hire you and you don't want to work there. So if yeah. you ask questions that reveal, reveal who you are, they'll get a sense for that. Then they'll see if that's right for you. In the book, I make a, make a point about finance industry, for instance. Um, I have a good friend uh, of, uh, who uh, is a trader in, on this, in, the, in the stock market. And, and, uh, and uh, he worked, he likes to trade. And and, uh, and the people that he works with like somebody like him who are, are uh, rude, uh, um, somewhat pushy, and and and, and uh, uh, not, I don't want to say always quiet. Whereas if you're working for a, and I have another somebody I work with here uh, in California who's with a uh, major bank and he, they invest people's money, and they're looking for somebody that's more collaborative and not competitive, and more who who are who are thoughtful and listen and careful and long-term folks, not short-term folks. Mm-hmm. So companies in the same industry can have very different uh, cultures based on, on uh, their goals, and how they're structured. So, that, so that's my third thing. And then uh, I go on to, I make another a few comments in the book about jobs. If you're not happy where you are now, maybe before you decide to leave, uh, think about what's going on in the organization. I did that at Xerox. I, uh, at one point, I, um, I, well, I said, Mike, this was in the education division I originally joined. Well, I said, Mike, this isn't going to go very well. Maybe we can find you another job somewhere else in Xerox. <laughs> and so he helped me get a job in another division. And, and, and so you never know if you can find opportunities outside of where you are, you may get it, be in a better place. So mm-hmm. first, look around and see if you can make a change there. And if you can do that, especially if you've been working hard and doing pretty well or reasonably well because they'll respect that. So that's an idea. Then another idea is I give later on when you join your new company, um, uh, you may, people may ask where you wish to work and you may be very proud of what you did there. But don't tell them that. Say, oh, I worked so-and-so place. And they don't really care. The more you say about how great it was, the less interested they're going to be in you. <laughs> so they want you to, they, the questions are, who are you and what are you going to do for me? How, well, how can I benefit from your working here? So that yeah. you, want, you want to connect with them in that sense. You're there to help mm-hmm. out, You're there to tell them how great you were. And uh, you want to develop relationships with the people that you trust and respect within the organization. There'll be some you like and don't. Some you think, no, nah, that person isn't person is going to help me work very well together. So think about the relationships, even in whatever you do. So 
that's a quick overview. Now, now what else were you sure? That was a long introduction. <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. I, you know, I, you and I spoke not too long ago, and you had shared, um, you know, a little bit of what you just shared uh, here moments ago. And it's just really interesting, all the different experiences you have. And of course, with those experiences comes wisdom. And obviously, when you sat down with your notebook and and you decided to write your book, and you're putting all of this information down, you know, it's, it's the wisdom, it's the experiences that you've had that fill the pages. And it's obvious that that's well, where the foundation is. Well, you know, they say, they say, old too soon, wise too late. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am yeah. 85 now. So I, I wish I knew then what I know now. But any, anyhow, uh, I've been very lucky. Uh, I, I've had a, a amazing two different careers, one in business, and then, then uh, executive search and people and the other in sailing. And mm-hmm. I sailed in Scandinavia numerous times with Dr. Chance. I sailed in Tallinn, Estonia a couple of times uh, uh, in, the, in their Russian International Sports Championship all on the East Coast. And now I'm in California sailing here. So, so we go in the summertime. So I, I still connect to, to the East Coast a little bit. So that's where I'm from. So then when it came to editing your book, you said that you had it printed out and then you went through it and you went through the editing process and you found that there was a lot of repetitive things. And, you know, when you're writing a uh, nonfiction book, I'm going to word it that way, because it's not so much that it's a self-help book it kind of goes across the board with nonfictions is that it's easy to keep repeating the same message over and over. Yes. Yes. Uh, You can find you say themselves, you say, I found myself saying the same thing twice. I said it in a different way, but it was the same idea. Mm -hmm. I had one that seemed to be the better, better way to say it and delete the other. And it was amazing how many times I did that. Uh, and, and, and so I getting rid of those and then examples, uh, somebody, I would get right an example. And then one of my wife or one of my sons, editing say, how's that relevant? Mike, to what you were just, <laughs> well, it was a good story. I don't know. So I had to make sure that the examples were really examples of what I was saying. And most of them are, <laughs> I don't say all of them. <laughs> but, uh, and my own experiences, uh, my family, they come out in the book. I mean, you, because you, you learn about people and the people you live with. I've been married for, it'll be 60 years in June. And so uh, we know each other pretty well. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, it's been amazing. Uh, wonderful life, really. Yeah. That's good. And congratulations on 60 years of marriage. Well, uh, thank you. Congratulate my wife. She's the one. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we get along great, and we're we're very different. I'm very steady, and she's up and down, uh, high up one minute, down the next. You know, that's the joy of relationships and finding that one is that there is that balance, and yes. and bringing out the best in the other one. And yes, yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. What you you want the you want the other person to be themselves and do their yes. whatever they want to do. And uh, my wife is a passionate gardener and she's, she's gardens here. She, our property, she's made a, like a, a arboretum out of it. And uh, we've given a garden to our church and, and uh, she's, we, there's a non-for-profit that helps homeless, homeless um, drug and alcoholic men find work, find, change their lives. And we give, and she was down there yesterday working in the garden that we donated for them. So yeah, she, and I'm, I'm more up in the brain, sort of. But, but um, no, I think writing a book is an emotional thing. It's not. It, it's really getting in touch with what you feel is important, and then articulating that. It's not it's not easy to do. And each time you, it's, it's, it's like many times things when you do something once and you redo it, it's a little better. It's a little more in focus. You keep working. It's more and more in focus. And, you delete the extraneous matters and just focus on what's important. Too often, I think, 
and I'm guilty of this as much as anybody else, I put out too many ideas at once. And you have to just say, no, no, what's important here? That's what you want to talk about. And, and I think in writing a book, uh, that's and in anything in life, really. You're talking to people. Don't, don't give them a whole lot of stuff. Just And, and um, another thing is, uh, when somebody tells you something they did, don't tell them what you did that was just like it. They don't want to hear that. <laughs> no, no, oftentimes no. <laughs> but yet your emotions, oh yeah, I'll tell them what I did. So we'll be doing, no. And in the book, the same thing. Just don't, don't, uh, when you, when you join a new company, don't tell them what you did. Just find out what they're doing there and help them be in the moment. So I like that. Be in their moment. In Not the moment. only in the moment, but in in their presence in their moment too so yes, yes. Uh, so so other than finding the different um rewording of the same thing uh the same message in your book what other you know was there any other pitfalls or or anything else that you know you want to talk about with the intent of helping somebody else who is writing a uh, you know, a book similar to yours? Well, I would say um, I did read a lot of books that were similar, and there are a lot of books about jobs, career changes. Mm-hmm. So I, I read them to see how they framed what they did. And of course, the one that's the most known is What Colors Your Parachute, which is, was written 20 years ago, and it gets updated. And uh, so you have to figure out how is your book different from that one? And what is it you're saying that, that's unique? And, 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 and focus on that so that somebody reading your book, they're probably going to read several books in the same subject as you, the one you've written. So uh, you want your book to be uh, unique for, and different than the others and unique to what you have to offer, not what you think you ought to say, but what you what you think you can offer. So mm-hmm. I would say that would be something that I found helpful to, to look at these other books. And actually, I have a... Um, I, uh, uh, what do you call it, a bibliography at the back of my book with about 20 or 30 books in it. Because over the years that I I was uh, in executive search and coaching, I read many books to get me to learn more about it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I learned about values for uh, mentioned in many of them. And uh, I learned a lot from them. So I think reading books in the areas that are relative what you're, what you're, you're specialty can help you better understand your your own ideas, how they fit in with the world. So I think that's helpful. And that's has helped me a lot too. And um, I, for instance, I'm very interested in, in people's lives and how they evolve. And there's mm-hmm. this study about that. And, uh, there's a study, the grant study uh, out of Harvard uh, studied men who were graduated from Harvard in the early, late 30s, and early 40s. And they tracked them their whole life and how they developed. And, uh, and they would interview them about once every year or so. And they would end up interviewing their spouses, their, their, their families. And they, the books were written about that. And there's another book that was in Boston about low-income people, how they evolved. And then there's one in California, a study of women, of successful women out of Stanford University, and what they did. And uh, so you see a pattern in life. And that's always, to me, fascinating. So reading, I think, is a, is a useful thing to expand one's perspective. I agree. Reading does help to expand uh, our perceptions on things. And it also provides us with somebody else's opinion. And in in doing perspective, perspective, but their perspective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it helps to enlighten us and, and question what we, what we ourselves believe to be true and like, Oh, well maybe there is another way or. Definitely. Yeah. And also uh, the other in the opposite side of that pendulum swing is, wow, I'm very similar to that person. It kind of mm-hmm. helps to bring um, that awareness that we're more more familiar than we are oftentimes led to believe. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. Yeah, no, you, you, uh, you uh, and, and actually the way I've written this book is I, I'm not saying it's for somebody just like me. It's for somebody that has to figure out who they are, and they they can go in the direction that makes sense for them, not for not for me for them, but for them for them. So, so yes, yeah, uh, 
and uh, you pick an industry that makes sense for you. Yeah, right. Well, definitely picking out that interest, uh, that industry that piques the curiosity, because when you're curious, you want to learn more. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. It, it, it doesn't carry that, oh, dread. <laughs> yeah, but well, it's like what you're doing. You're, you're meeting all people from many different backgrounds and interests. I mean, you're, you're learning, I imagine you're learning a lot from the interviews you hear, you're, uh, you're doing. Oh, yes. Yes, I That's am. Someday. <laughs> I, you know, I have met some of the most interesting individuals, and I have met more people who it's like uh, one, uh, several other gals that I've talked to, it's it's like, wow, are we sisters from other mothers? <laughs> it's like, where have you been? You know? And then a, a couple of the gentlemen that I've talked to have really kind of helped me per, because I have two sons yeah. and they've helped me to put into perspective the male opinion and the oh, male yeah. sight. And so, yeah, I'm always learning. Yeah. And I find it very easy to, you know, just listen and observe and be a participant, obviously, since I'm the host. Yeah, <laughs> yeah be participating. Yeah. But uh, no, it's and I find great joy in exploring how people create and what drives that creation and, and inspires them to keep going because like you know writing is not necessarily a short process it's not necessarily no. an easy process but right. there's something inside that keeps us going and that is part of the intent of this podcast is to keep people motivated to keep going and to keep yeah. following their their passion because to write a book there's a calling within us deep yes, down the you side, to keep going I think you have to feel it's something you really want to say. and You have some reason for doing it. It's not about you. It's about what you, what you want to do with what's within you to have it more impact uh, and helpful to others and to share. So they turn. I have a son, actually, is a philosopher. He's been working for 30 years. Can you believe that? I mean, how do you get that old uh, on, 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 uh, on the sense of reality? And he feels actually that he's working on something that Plato addressed. And he, in his lifetime, my son, Tim, Timothy, uh, will spend his, spending his life working on that idea. What is reality? What is it really? And, um, and, and he will be, somebody will follow him. He's got younger people now who are getting PhDs that are going to pick up where he's leaving off. So it, it's sometimes what you're doing, you're part of a, not only today's world, but you're, you're part of a world that's kind of came before you and, and one will come after you. And so if your perspective is really that broad, I think you, it'll help you uh, determine what's most important. I could not have said that any better. And I love that your son is working in reality, with reality, yeah. about reality. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's I real. <laughs> Honest, God. I thought he was going to go into finance. He would have been very good at that. <laughs> yeah, but philosophy. No, yeah. He wanted to be a professor. <laughs> he is. That's that's wonderful. So then with all of your experiences and being somebody who's been out there and doing all of these different things, you know, it's obvious that you have no issues with you know, going out and saying hi to somebody right. for you was, is marketing and, and promoting your book easy for you? Or do you still have that? Ooh, do I really want to tell somebody about my well, book? You know, that's a good question. I was thinking of raising that question because marketing is something we haven't talked about. Yes. And, uh, and I'm having difficulty marketing my book, getting visibility for it. And it may be the title it's such a bland title. I, I picked the title because it was what it is. It, 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 I, I just tried to be in the essence of what I'm saying and, mm -hmm. and finding the, and I use the, the um, quote from Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. 
Uh, so my my subtitle is from that poem. Uh, two ro- and the last stanza is two roads divided in a wood. And I I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. That's from Robert Frost. He read that in about 1916 or something like that. Um, so um, yeah, and then uh, and also my book is one where somebody's going to have to put a lot of thought and effort into it. It's mm-hmm. not you can just pick up get a couple ideas and move on. It's, that's not what it's for. It's for sort of a nerd type of person, somebody that's really going to take go to the, the effort to figure out who they really are and, 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 and then network in a way that's appropriate and ask questions of the client, the, the potential job. Um, and so um, I'm, uh, I'm thinking things like this podcast will be helpful if the people will see, maybe learn a little bit more about it because there's so many books as you go on Amazon, and that's where my book was printed. And uh, I think they were very good in working with me. Um, but they, did, they, I did chose Amazon also because I wanted to write the book. I didn't want some editor to tell me what was important. <laughs> I had, I just picked up a book a friend of mine has written, who's a racetrack driver, and um, his name is uh, Ed Schwart, and he's in his 80s, and he's been racing cars for 80 years. He's written a wonderful book. Um, but it goes through his background. And he said, you know, I put in, I started a young man sailing. And they didn't put that in the book. And I, I think he probably should have had it in the book because that's who he was when he started his competing. He first competed in sailboats. Then he got into cars, mini cars, and then Formula Ones. And, and he's been all over the world. Uh, not, well, not all over the world. Anyway. He's been all in the United States and major races. And, and he started out in Europe. He's English. And, uh, but so... Sure, we're reading about that. It's like marketing is not 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 easy. And one thing, if you have a publisher, the publisher will will do a lot more for you in marketing your book. If you do it mm-hmm. Amazon, as I've done it, I have to do a lot myself. I do have, a, a, as you know, Lisa who's helping me with the publicity, and I have a website guy that's been very helpful. The podcast that we're putting on 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 LinkedIn on uh, YouTube. Um, so. Uh, but it's very definitely a major effort on the part of the author. Uh, one writes a book at Amazon, they have to think in terms of putting a lot of effort into it themselves. And yes. I'm doing that. It's kind of fun. I think. But I wish it would be more successful. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, where I used to teach at LMU, the executive director, who I don't know, uh, said he wants to have all the students to read the book and have me lecture there. So I'm thinking maybe it's a Jesuit University where values are really important. I think any place where values are considered to be important. This is, this, this, my book is about a values-based approach to your life and to your job search. That would be the quick summary of it. Yes. Yeah, so marketing's a difficult. I don't mind doing it. It's kind of fun. I mean, I've been in marketing my whole life, really, one way or another. Even as a kid, I used to sell stuff to make money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it, marketing is see for me and and the it's one of the questions that somehow gets brought up in in the majority of the podcast and it's interesting it it doesn't matter the personality whether introvert extrovert you know uh somebody feels that they are you know the world's greatest salesperson or if they feel that they are you know sales is like oh my gosh no 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 i don't want to do it all of them have the same reaction and that is you know i'm struggling with it or i can sell other people's stuff but i cannot sell my own and that seems to be the common theme and it's like you know, so then in the back of my mind, I'm like, how can I help people so that they get to where it's not such a uh, a dreaded task, you know, or I, I don't know, it's, it's like that question that just keeps lurking in the back of my head, how can I help people get their book out there? And one suggestion, I have a couple of suggestions. First of all, there's a difference between sales and marketing. Oh, yes. Marketing is obviously much broader. It's, it's using different ways of communicating what you have. Or, and then the other is, and sales is more direct, one-to-one. Mm-hmm. In both cases, people should not think about themselves, but think about the message that they're 
try to promote their belief in that message and have have enough uh, a sense of confidence in the message. They feel they're going to benefit others by getting that message out. It's not about themselves. It's about the message. And if they think about think of it that way, then maybe they'd be more uh, feel better about promoting the, whatever it is they've written about promoting, mm-hmm. that. especially a nonprofit. I mean, and a, a, a nonfiction, a fiction book, a little different. You, there you have a story, but even the stories, there's a message in almost any story you read. Uh, oh yes, and. That's a message that, that really they want to get out. And uh, we have a friend who wrote a book in uh, Maine. Uh, she's from Maine, and she's written a book about uh, a murder mystery. Actually, it took place in the Maine woods, and uh, it's been very well received there. Uh, Claire Ackroyd, her name. <laughs> she was Claire, and it's gotten a lot of publicity. The book has, it, and it gets into the the. Um, what is it? The honey, uh, maple, maple syrup, maple syrup business there. Okay. And there's an issue with Canada. And uh, so it's, there's a lot of things going on in even a state backwards, Maine, that it can be interesting if it's written about it well. That's interesting. I have a friend that lives in Maine. So <laughs> I'll have to ask her if she's heard yeah, of this yeah, book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Murder in the, I forget what the name of the title is. It's something like, Murder in the Woods, maybe something like that. Okay. Claire yeah. Ackroyd, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so those books, there's a, there's a message in that book too. And, uh, and it's a story about Maine. So uh, nonfiction books can give you a story about an area uh, that you don't know about, which is fun. Yes. Um, well, and a lot of people in, uh, how do I want to word this so that it doesn't come across wrong oftentimes people don't want to write a memoir but what they will do is they will convert what has happened to them into a fictional storyline yes yes to share what has happened and to share their truth with it being tucked into a fictional story that's good yes i can understand people doing it that way they don't want to be about themselves so much they're not trying to yeah, they're trying to get a story out that they think is people could learn from or enjoy reading about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then there are others who write fiction just purely for the joy of, you know, telling the story. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> and same with the nonfiction. I mean, nonfiction is that too. A lot of people add their story, you know, it's weaved into the book, you know, yeah. as a way of livening up the content and making it relatable so yeah yeah no i uh and i've i've read some nonfiction authors i uh there's one i forget the name he wrote about the midwest growing up there and or i forget where it would be I can, too many years ago but and i'm reading a book now by a guy who's an author lives in in uh nantucket and he writes very good books about it, the history of nantucket he's reading Writing, written one about, about President Washington when he first became president. He traveled around the country just to, to bring the country together. And, mm-hmm. and uh, he'd come in on a big horse and, and a lot of dignitaries would meet him. And then he would meet the chief of families. And, and uh, more than once, some little kid would come up and say, well, daddy, he's just a man. <laughs> yeah. Isn't he's that just funny? A, I'm just a man. And then Washington, that's right, kid. I'm just a man like everybody else. Yeah, because those those people in in power or well, you know, uh, a great example is I had uh, Richard Linton on this podcast. Uh, yeah, there was a while ago, and you know, he's an actor, and he's I've seen him on this big screen, and I've seen him on the little screen, and yeah. it's interesting is the fact that you know when when I uh, first talked to him, I said, the part that, you know, the the fact that you're a movie star and all of that doesn't intimidate me or doesn't make me, you know, like, oh, I'm talking to an actor. So the part that intimidates me is you do exactly what I do. And he laughed because he has a podcast and he has a, or well, it's a TV show. And that TV show is focused on authors talking to authors to help 
bring awareness. And I'm like, so that's the part that intimidates me is because you do what I do. And how much better at it are you than I am, you know? (laughs) You know, so it's, it was a very good and definitely a learning experience for me. Um, Yeah, great respect for that, for that man. He's uh, he's a really good guy. So. (laughs) He's a person, too. I mean, he's just. Well, yeah, you know, and I know some very to do people. And it's interesting watching, being on the sidelines and watching other people swoon and, oh, you know, and it's like, (laughs) it's just another person. He puts on his pants the same way you do. Guess what? He brushes his teeth or she brushes her teeth just like you do. Yeah, they're just people. We're all people just wanting the same thing. We all want to feel joy. We all want peace in our lives. We all want to feel loved and give love. And so, yes, taking away that, you know, that statuous perception that this is beyond life. (laughs) (laughs) Like There's no pedestal there. We're all feet on the ground. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, the, I'm just looking at the clock. Is there anything that you would like to share with an author to give them that nugget of information that that you want to share? Well, I would say that um, I say you, we all live just once, and and therefore. Um, we want to, I would say, think about what you want to contribute. You're only around for a few years, a few more years. How do you want to finish? The, how do you want to use those years productively? And if, if writing a book is that, then do that. If something else is important, do that. But think of, think of but where, what's important to you at this point in your life. It may be your grandchildren and not writing a book. It may be, you just never know. Uh, so mm-hmm. I would, that's what my advice would be. Think about the fact that you, that you were, life is short. <laughs> Enjoy it and, and live it for the moment. Yes, yes, I agree. Oh, Michael, it's been so good to talk with you. I'm so <laughs> glad that we had this time and in learning about your history and and learning where you got your experience to add to your story. You know, to your book. Excuse me. And when we know the story behind the scenes, it gives us that extra like, oh, yeah, I want to know more. So yeah, thank uh, you for sharing that. I appreciate Oh, my pleasure, Cindy. Thank you. Great questions. It's great to get to know you a little bit, too. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Before we end our time together, I'd like to say thank you for listening to my conversation with Michael Shuttle. To access his website and purchase the books he has written, visit pentapaperpress.com backslash podcast and select the show notes page for this episode. What is one takeaway you received from our conversation? What are some of your core values or what are some of the questions you'll be asking at your next interview? Drop by the show notes page and let us know. To receive future episodes in your inbox, be sure to subscribe to the newsletter and follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app. You are invited to share your favorite episode with individuals who will resonate with the content. Take care, and until next time, keep your pen to paper and write. Your words have power, and your story matters. Bye for now.